for the first Newman Society talk of the term. Um, tonight, uh, we're very pleased to have Father Richard Conrad with us from Blackfriars, um, and he's going to talk about uh, St. Thomas Aquinas on God's mystery and friendship. Um, so uh, also, just to let you all know, uh, for the Zoom social after Adoration, Benediction, Compline, which will come at the end of the talk, um, the first 15 minutes or so will be our annual AGM. Um, it'll be quite short, so just come along um, and you can learn about what we've been doing in the past year. Uh, so, Father Richard, uh, take it away. Well, I'd like to thank Vincent and the Newman Society for their kind invitation to speak about St. Thomas Aquinas, whose feast day is in a week's time. I'm the director of the Aquinas Institute, so I should know something about him. I'd like to give um, a bit of an overview of his context and life, and then look at the two themes in the title, God's mystery, God's friendship, and some of the implications. So St. Thomas was born in or just before 1226 in the kingdom of Naples, the southern bit of Italy, and died in 1274. And it's amazing how much writing he crammed into a relatively short life by modern standards. The 13th century was a vibrant and complex and ambiguous time with some similarities as well as some differences from our own age. The vibrancy was partly due, some people think, to several centuries of global warming, with people more healthy and better fed. Though, of course, there were epidemics. But it's in the next century that there were some really bad harvests, and then the pandemic of the Black Death, and a significant change in mood in Europe. The vibrancy that I mentioned was partly cultural, and academic. The universities were being established or had recently been established, like Paris, Bologna and Oxford. My own of Cambridge was slightly later, but we have a papal charter unlike Oxford. There, were, there had been new styles of philosophy and theology developed, a more analytical style, which we call scholastic, because a century or two earlier, the cathedral schools in the cities had become the main centers of learning in place of the monasteries in the countryside. That's a rough picture. The vibrancy I mentioned was also religious. There had been monastic reform movements leading to the Cistercians, for example, Early in the 13th century, the friars were founded, Franciscans, Dominicans, Carmelites, and Servites. St. Dominic, our founder, died 800 years ago this year, five years or a bit less before St. Thomas was born. It's worth mentioning that there had been significant developments in people's devotion over the previous couple of centuries, with a great surge in devotion to Christ's humanity. So an interest in the incarnation, St. Francis invents the Christmas crib, a strong devotion to Christ's passion, a strong devotion to the Eucharist, and St. Thomas composed the mass and office for Corpus Christi, which, parts of which are still used and a great devotion to Our Lady, through whom the Word became flesh. And this focus was expressed in devotion and in theology. The age, as I said, was ambiguous and complex, partly because there was cultural exchange of ideas among Christians, Jews and Muslims, at the same time as there was enmity between Christian and Muslim states vying for territory. Part of the intellectual ferment of the 13th century 
was the rediscovery or the new availability in Latin of the works of the ancient philosopher Aristotle on the natural world. First in translation from the Arabic translations that Muslim scholars were using, and then during St. Thomas's time, direct from the original Greek. And quite a lot of philosophers of the time were keen on Aristotle. A lot of theologians were much more ambiguous about his value. So an age of great vibrancy and development but there were also significant gaps in knowledge. One interesting thing I discovered relatively recently is that until St. Thomas's time, most people didn't know the acts of the early ecumenical councils. So in the century before St. Thomas, there had been discussion of how best to give an account of how Jesus Christ is true God and true man, and there were three main opinions which theologians recognised. But St Thomas knew that at Monte Cassino there were the acts of the early councils, and when he was stationed in Rome and Orvieto, he found the acts either by visiting Monte Cassino or looking in the papal archives, and could tell people that two of the widespread opinions on the incarnation had been condemned as heresies centuries earlier. So his biography, he was born, as I said, in the kingdom of Naples and was sent as a boy to Monte Cassino to be educated by the Benedictine monks. And then he went to university at Naples at the time that the works of Averroes, an important Arabic Muslim philosopher and commentator on Aristotle, his works were becoming available in Latin for people to read. In Naples, St. Thomas met and joined the Dominicans. His family didn't think he ought to be a mere scruffy friar. They thought he might become abbot of Monte Cassino and improve the family fortunes. So they put him under house arrest, which gave him time for study, and eventually his mother helped him to escape. So he went to Paris to study as a Dominican, and he was there in an international academic environment, very interested in drawing on the many sources available for philosophy and theology. The English academic Alexander of Hales had become a Franciscan and he and his colleagues in Paris had been writing and were writing the first summer of theology, which is basically, I think, a rather substantial and demanding first degree course in theology for people who know some philosophy already. In Paris, Thomas was taught by Albert the Great, who was keen on using Aristotle's ideas and synthesizing them with other traditions. And in fact, it was he, maybe with others, who revived the experimental method. People had been spending some time and energy working out what Aristotle said and meant and Albert was keen on trying out by experiment the opinions of Aristotle and others, observing the natural world. They didn't have the delicate instruments available from the 17th century, but Albert is rightly seen as not just the patron, but also in some ways a founder of modern science. Albert went to Cologne and St. Thomas joined him there for a time to continue studying, then came back to Paris to do a three-year term as a Master of Theology. Then he was for nine years in Rome and Orvieto. The papal court was in Orvieto. That's where he composed the office of Corpus Christi. 
He spent a further three years in Paris and then two years in Naples setting up a study house, which he was still doing when he died. He didn't live in an ivory tower. When he was in Paris the first time, there was a great controversy whether the friars should be allowed to teach in the university and elbow some of the secular priests out of their university jobs. I think the king had to send archers to defend the friars. And the second time Thomas was in Paris, there was a rather um, sharp argument about whether Aristotle and his ideas should be allowed. And in fact, three years after he died, some ideas drawn from Aristotle were condemned by Oxford and Paris universities. And the condemnations insofar as they touched St. Thomas were revoked when he was canonized some decades later. It was the archbishops of Canterbury and Paris who um, put through the condemnations. The Archbishop of Canterbury was a Dominican, so he knows better now. He was replaced by a Franciscan who was even more opposed to St. Thomas's teaching. Any school of theology at the time mostly ran by having lectures mostly on scripture for four hours each morning. And so St. Thomas had to lecture on the sacred scriptures and his commentaries got written up and published. And he also commented on Aristotle and other important works of philosophy and theology. But on some days you'd hold a disputation, you'd choose or there would be set a very precise topic to discuss the class would meet and would have to offer arguments for and against a particular position. And on the next day, the master would give his opinion, then answer all the points that had been made as far as necessary. Those got written up and published also. Besides the disputed questions, Thomas also wrote treatises of varying lengths on topics people had asked him about. And he wrote the Summa Contra Gentes as a handbook for missionaries and the Summa Theologiae, his first degree course in theology. So he was one of many important and interesting medieval thinkers of the centuries before and after. He has been not just the most famous, but perhaps the most influential partly because not just Dominicans, but also Jesuits chose to follow his teaching and the church has officially commended it. His writing is extremely clear and goes for academic solidity. That helps it be understandable. Scotus was much more complex in his Latin. Thomas was also synthetic he draws on scripture and the councils and the church fathers of East and West. He draws on Jewish and Muslim ideas. He draws on Aristotle and other philosophical strands of thought. And he synthesizes it in a masterly way and gives masterly judgments. Though nowadays we realize that he did change his mind more often than his previous followers thought he should have done. And some of his work is clearly work in progress. His account of the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit is developing as he writes the Summer of Theology. One reason why people are interested in St. Thomas is that in his own time, he drew on current cosmology, the current understanding of the cosmos, as a kind of model for how we must also keep our feet in the real world. Obviously, the cosmos or the view of it has changed significantly since his time, 
but we can still bring his ideas into dialogue with things like quantum mechanics. More importantly, perhaps, he drew from Aristotle and the Arabic commentators a very complex and subtle view of human psychology. In the 17th century, the philosopher Descartes thought that the animal body and the human body are hydraulic machines. So animals have no emotions, but the human being is a kind of angel using the pineal gland, and he thought wrongly that only human beings had a pineal gland. The soul, a kind of little angel, was using it as a kind of steering column to interact with the body. And it's not very easy to bring Descartes' views into really fruitful conversation with modern discoveries in animal and human psychology. But we can do that with St. Thomas because he knew how complex and subtle animal psychology is, though he wasn't aware of the social systems of the great apes. He was well aware of the animal components, you might say, of the human psyche and how our senses, our emotions, our imagination are in a kind of intricate organic relationship with intellect and will, powers that we share with the angels. So we have one coherent but extremely complex psyche, open to the world and open to God because intellect and will, our openness to truth and goodness, mean we are open to God, the true and the good. So I think St. Thomas was keen on getting human psychology right, because it gives you a sense of where it is that God's grace takes flesh to transform our lives. But it is possible to bring St. Thomas's ideas into a very fruitful dialogue with modern discoveries in psychology. We have to be open to those discoveries. Thomas would want us to be open, but we can also, with his help, pose interesting philosophical and theological questions. So people have sometimes thought that St. Thomas's thought is like a medieval cathedral. And I think they mean it is complex, but also watertight and complete. In fact, it's not really like Salisbury Cathedral, which was built in one go and is coherent and neat. It's more like one of those complex medieval cathedrals, intriguing and almost fractal, if you like, which is still being built and has no roof because it's open to the sky as a symbol of God. So that leads on to my first main topic, the mystery of God. The God to whom, as human beings made in his image, we are open. One great 20th century scholar, Etienne Gilson, said that St. Thomas practiced what he called the metaphysics of Exodus. He was thinking of what was revealed when Israel came out of Egypt. From that time comes the Shema, Hear, O Israel, Adonai our God, Adonai is one. So the unity of God is important as it is for St. Thomas. But Adonai, the word I used, stands for the name that was revealed to Moses in chapter three of Exodus at the burning bush, a name which came to be pronounced only in the temple in Jerusalem and otherwise replaced by Adonai, my Lord. And it's explained as I am who am. In the third century BC, 
the Jews in Alexandria translated the first bit of the Bible into Greek. And that explanation went into Greek as ego eimi ha own, I am the one who is. And St. Thomas said that he who is, is in fact the best name we have for God. I think myself that the name revealed to Moses in Hebrew does mean he is making things to be. Whether that's true or not, certainly it came to be understood as I am the one who is. God alone possesses being. All creatures receive being from God as a gift. And that is very much St. Thomas's position. God alone possesses being. All creatures from the lowest to the highest must receive being as a gift from God. And that makes God radically different from all creatures. That's what we find in chapter 40 of the book of Isaiah, part of the part of the book 40 to 55, which was written during the exile in Babylon, at the same time as the first chapter of Genesis was being written. So Isaiah says, to what, to whom will you compare me, says the Lord? Lift up your eyes and see who created these. And that bit of Isaiah and the people who wrote Genesis 1 and other bits of the early parts of the Bible used the Hebrew verb bara in a new way to mean create not just to rearrange and transform stuff, but to call the cosmos into being. So Thomas gets from scripture and Jewish and Christian and Muslim traditions that sense that God possesses being and creatures must receive it. And in fact, he held that view more sharply than many thinkers, both Christian and Muslim. Because there had been and there were people who thought that God could delegate creation in some ways. In the fourth century, Arius claimed that God the Father had created God the Son, the divine word, who wasn't truly God, and then the divine word had created everything else. And of course, that was condemned as heresy. But there were Christian and Muslim thinkers who thought God could create a great angel whom God would use as a kind of instrument or channel of granting being to other things. And St. Thomas says very firmly, that can't happen. He was keen on the idea that God can use instruments and channels for many things, and we'll come back to that. But of course, something that you use as an instrument has to be apt to be used in that way. I can use a saw made of metal to cut wood because metal is apt to be wielded in that way. But for St. Thomas, all creatures, even the highest angel, have to receive being as a gift from God. They are so totally dependent that they have no aptitude to be even a channel of God's creative power. Of course, creatures can bring new things into being by transforming old things. So a few weeks before Christmas, I assembled the ingredients and applied heat, and there were our Christmas puddings. But I couldn't have called them into being without assembling the ingredients. 
only God does that. So almost everyone knows that St. Thomas had five ways of proving that God exists. The middle one, the third way, encourages us to wonder at the very being of things. God holds everything in being all the time. St. Thomas thinks that if we hadn't fallen, and if our minds were sharper, that would be obvious to us. As it is, we go into the garden and see the tree and are struck by its colour and shape, and how it changes colour in the autumn. We might look at a pen and notice its design and how good or bad it is at its job of writing. But if we could see clearly, we would, with our mind's eye, see God at work holding the tree in being and holding this pen in being now. And if God withdrew his love, it just wouldn't be here. So God is radically different from his creatures. And that means that some pictures of God don't work, at least for a follower of St. Thomas. We shouldn't think that God literally is a great spirit alongside many other spirits, but just greater and more powerful and more wise. We shouldn't think of God as merely the great watchmaker who crafts the world, sets it going, and then sits back while it runs itself. Those pictures of God imply that God might be a threat to us because he might interfere with the world that ought to be running itself. It might mean that God competes for space with other spirits. And the more God does, the less space there is for creatures to do things. And that's exactly not what St. Thomas thinks. God, as the giver of being, gives being to all things, not just substances, but all their powers and their interactions. So whenever anything happens in the world, like when the gas boils the kettle, God is holding in being the gas and the water and the power of the gas to boil the water and the action of the gas boiling the water. So God is not acting instead of his creatures much of the time, rather because of God, they are doing what they do with their real powers and actions. So God is not a threat, but if you like, the great enabler. The more God does in his world, the more creatures do. But there are some things that God does which creatures can't do. And some of those things are miracles, like raising the dead. But there are other things, some of them greater than many miracles, that only God can, does, can do. And he normally does them in such a way that the creatures are involved even in that. So the human being is more than a biological reality. The human soul, the human form of life, has to be created by God. But it's not that human beings have nothing to do. Parents engage in the act of procreation. They minister the biological material that God, in a kind of intimate 
working with the biological process lifts to a higher level, giving us an immortal form of life in which we are in his image and likeness. And then we perform free actions because we have intellect and will and nothing in the world fully determines what we do freely. But it's not that we act independently of God. God is within mind and will, attracting and inspiring, granting truth, attracting to the good. And so Herbert McCabe, who was a great exponent of St. Thomas in this priory and died 20 years ago, was eloquent on how our free actions are in fact a share in God's own freedom. That of course makes it difficult to understand how human beings commit sin and the Jesuits are better at that than the Dominicans are. But we want to say that Thomas wants to say with St. Augustine that when God does more in us, he makes us more free. Because by grace, God enlarges, enriches our hearts, our minds, our wills to help us rise more wholeheartedly to love and want and pursue what is really good for us. So God's healing grace lifts us to higher and higher degrees of freedom where we become more whole, not in spite of God, but because of what God is doing in us. In fact, St. Paul had called grace a new creation. St. Peter says we are lifted up to share the divine nature. And St. Thomas again was eloquent following Augustine on how when the baby is baptized, something more wonderful happens than when the whole cosmos sprang into being because the creature is becoming divine. But it happens through human ministry. Grace flows into the world through Christ's humanity and to us through the sacraments with their ministers. So God's otherness, in which God alone possesses being and alone grants it, does not mean that God is distant or aloof. He is present in all things holding them in being closer to us than we are to ourselves, Augustine says. And we can speak, in fact, of God's love, God's proactive will going out to craft and cherish the goodness of his creatures, giving them the many things that they do, reflecting his own beauty and goodness and wisdom. That mention of God's love leads me on to my final topic, the friendship of God. What I have said so far implies that God has a love for all things, calling them into being and holding them in being but St. Thomas thinks that for us and for the angels, God has a higher kind of love, which in fact we can call friendship. St. Thomas wrote eloquently about faith, hope and charity. And he says charity, the love between us and God, is a friendship. He got from Aristotle the importance of friendship in human fulfillment, in the coherence of society. And Aristotle had pointed out that you can't be friends with a slave whom you possess. Friendship requires an element of equality 
and reciprocity. St. Thomas knows how mysterious and other God is, and yet God lifts us up to be his children and friends. Jesus tells us that we aren't called slaves or servants, but friends. There's some mysterious kind of equality. That's a very strange and striking thing to say. And an element of reciprocity, which is also strange because God is first the source of all being and all goodness. And yet there is reciprocity between us and God. Because by grace, God enlarges our minds and wills, enlarges our hearts, so that we can embrace God, so to speak, by not knowing him and loving him. So to speak of a friendship between us and God is really rather amazing and very dignifying for us. And it helps explain life, the universe and everything. Of course, if you've read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, you'll know that the mice in their fifth dimensional home invent a computer called Deep Thought to work out the answer to life, the universe and everything, and it turns out to be 42. But that's wrong. It's actually 43. Well, I say that because in the first part of his Summer of Theology, after one question on what theology and catechetics is, St. Thomas devotes questions 2 to 42 on God, who is perfectly one and Trinity, Father, Son and Spirit, in a way that defeats our powers of explanation. And question 44 launches the treatise on creation and the second and third parts of the summer explore God's work of salvation. So question 43 is a kind of hinge. It explains why God goes out in the work of creation and salvation. <clears throat> and it turns out it's because the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit each wants to give himself to us, to be known and loved, possessed and enjoyed, now and forever. <clears throat> so God is in all things, as holding them in being, but to use St Paul's phrase, God wants to dwell in us as in a temple, as the known in the knower, and the beloved in the lover. <clears throat> God lifts us up and empowers us to receive his gift of himself. The triune God works on us, so to speak, so that we can enter into that reciprocity, that friendship with God, in which we know and love, possess and enjoy the three divine persons. And the flip side to question 43 is question 93 on how we are made in the image and likeness of God. Following Saint Augustine and developing him, Saint Thomas points out that by having intellect and will, we are capax dei, capable of God. We can be enlarged, empowered to embrace the goodness and the truth that God is. And so because we have intellect and will, we are already in the image of the Holy Trinity by nature. But we are lifted up by grace to know God in an initial way by faith and to love God by charity to begin to embrace God already. 
and we are lifted up to a higher degree of likeness to God to become a more perfect image of God in heaven when we will know God as he is and so charity will be even stronger and we will share God's own knowledge of himself and God's own delight in himself. So St. Thomas gives us that amazing notion of friendship with God, God bringing us into reciprocity with himself and giving us himself in friendship, sharing his own happiness, his own life and bliss with us. It seems to me that as his career went on, St. Thomas was more and more aware of how the great mysteries of our faith defeat our power of explanation. We can still speak, he speaks eloquently about the mysteries of faith, but you get a sense that he is stretching human words and philosophical concepts to point to something or someone that transcends our power to grasp. So the Holy Trinity, the mystery of the friendship that God is, is beyond our power to grasp, but so is the incarnation. The Son of God enters into solidarity with us becoming one of our family but the union between God and man in Christ doesn't fit into any of the kinds of union that we know of in the world. It's something beyond. And Jesus lays down his life for his friends. Christ's passion is the great act of friendship towards us and we can get some small glimpse from our sufferings of Christ's suffering but we can't fathom everything achieved by Christ's passion, death and resurrection. They reach out in their power to the whole of human history to bring people into friendship with God but they achieve more than the human imagination can comprehend, St Thomas says. And the Eucharist is the great sacrament of Jesus's friendship, wanting to be with his friends until the end of time as intimately as possible. But the change of the whole being of bread and wine into Christ's whole being is something that only God's power can achieve it doesn't fit into the kinds of change that we know how to talk about and deal with from our interaction with the world around us. And as I said, Father, Son and Spirit abide within us in friendship. And there's something to the life of grace, which is too deep to articulate. And then in the life of glory. We will know God as he is, but it's beyond the power of human imagination, as St. Paul says, to comprehend how that will be and what it will be like. So there's a little glimpse of St. Thomas's biography and work, and a glimpse of two aspects of his teaching and something of their implications, which I hope can help us ponder more deeply and be more amazed by the mystery of God and the friendship and love of God, so that faith and hope are nourished and we can go on pilgrimage until they are replaced by sight and possession and our charity, our love of God, can grow 
until in heaven it comes to perfection. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Father Richard. That was a, a fantastic talk. So um, uh, for people watching at home on YouTube, you've probably seen some people already dropping some questions in the in the comments. So if you have any questions you'd like to ask, then please do <coughs> throw them in there. Um, so just to get things going, um, you mentioned briefly about um, the Aryan heresy. Um, and so I just wanted to also, that's something I read on my course, um, a uh, Eastern Orthodox Metropolitan um, described the, the generation of the sun as the sort of uh, an act, as a, a positive act of the will of the father. Um, and so I was wondering uh, what St. Thomas would have to say about that sort of comes from God's love but as an intentional act rather than necessarily just sort of coming about in itself? Well, I'd want to go back to St. Athanasius, um, who had to address the issue um, which the Arians put to him. Um, was God the Father forced to generate his son, which seems very odd, or did God the Father choose to generate his son, so he might not have done so. And St. Athanasius says, neither. It's the way God is. Naturally, neither forced nor an arbitrary choice. So I think St. Thomas would agree with Athanasius that God is Trinity. That's the way God is but it's not that anything forces God to be that way, it's not a choice, but it is personal relationships. The father begets his son, expresses himself fully and perfectly in his image, his word, his wisdom, and the medieval theologians um, had various ways of trying to express that, or at least sell that picture. So some, um, like Richard of St. Victor and St. Bonaventure, were keen on how, if God is supreme goodness, he must communicate himself, because goodness does communicate itself. So it makes sense that the Father should beget the Son, and they should breathe forth the Holy Spirit. St. Thomas tends, I think, to say, we are in the image of God. So what goes on in the human psyche gives us a little glimpse of what goes on in God, but just a tiny glimpse. And we automatically know ourselves and our plans, so we can, if you like, picture God, the Father, as knowing himself and his plans, and expressing all that in his word. But that's a little picture of what goes beyond our comprehension, but it means that St. Thomas can say that from all eternity, God the Father knows himself and knows us in his creative word. And further, from all eternity, the Father and the Son love each other and love themselves and love us in the Holy Spirit, the divine love. So in the eternal life of God, we are there already, planned in the Word, and loved in the Holy Spirit. And what happens in time is the outpouring of that eternal cherishing of us that's in God. So there are different ways of getting a bit of purchase on the Trinity, but I would be wary with St. Thomas of saying God 
of giving any hint that God the Father simply chooses to beget his son. Thank you. That's really interesting. Uh, Matthew is asking, um, are we not used as God's instruments in bringing children into being? It seems to run contrary to what Aquinas is saying. Also, what would he say about the notion of humans bringing ideas into being? Mm. Um, yes. Um, in St. Thomas sees God as the unmoved first mover. So God is not just behind the being of things, but behind all that happens in the way that it happens. So we do bring ideas into being. There's a spontaneity in our intellects and our wills. But the human being is not the unmoved first mover. It's because God is already empowering us to think and attracting us to the good that these things happen. So it is true that we initiate thoughts and it's true that we love but our love tends to be a response to goodness that we perceive. But none of this happens independently of God. It happens because we are so much in God's image and God is so much at work in us. Not putting ideas into our heads the way some Christian Platonists thought, or well, he does sometimes with prophecy and so on, but often we are interacting with the world and crafting our concepts and so on. But God is still lying behind that in a subtle and um, intimate way, if you like. And then human beings do um, bring others into being, but not completely. At least the Catholic Church has long insisted that the human soul is directly created by God. We have to find a way of expressing that, that meshes modern understandings of reproductive biology. But in some kind of intimate interaction with the biological process, the human conceptus is lifted to the higher level of being the rational animal conceived by the parents but raised to being the image of God. Um, of course when St Thomas like St John of Damascus uses the notion of instrument he means that some instruments are animate and willing and deliberate so Christ is the channel of grace into the world but not a kind of tool of an impersonal kind. So in fact, the love between husband and wife and their act of union is instrumental in that humane way and involved in the act of um, procreation, ministering the conceptus to God for his further act. That's roughly how I would try and put it. Great, thank you. Um, Emmett asks, uh, for many, the problem of evil is God's apparent inaction in the face of suffering. Uh, but does the Thomistic view not deepen this conundrum if God actively holds in, per uh, holds in being a person engaged in moral evil? Yes. Um, it's especially difficult for Dominicans to give an account of evil. Well, Herbert McCabe um, gave quite a subtle account. Um, what God holds in being, as Augustine had already said, is what is good, because things are good as far as they exist. So all evil at root is the absence of some good that should be there. So 
the absence of life is the evil of death and the absence of love leads to sin where a greater love for the greater good doesn't keep in check our little loves for lesser goods or even for illusory goods so evil doesn't need to be made it's where something isn't that ought to be there and in the case of evil suffered then there are competing goods the lion only gets fed if the gazelle gets eaten and it's good for the lion bad for the gazelle good for the ecosystem but applying that to human suffering and applying that to human sin is really rather a difficult question god doesn't will evil but he permits it and as the questioner said god holds in being the lion that's eating the gazelle or the coronaviruses that are attacking people now or the murderer or rapist and there's something of a mystery there which i don't think we can easily um, solve even if i had 10 hours rather than one minute to do it so i agree there is a mystery there um i think saint thomas like mother julian but less eloquently than mother julian does urge us to hope that good is brought out of evil um, that's what saint thomas says quite often and it's insisted on by mother julian but we can't always see how but those who suffer do suffer in some kind of solidarity with christ but saint thomas seems reticent of giving a complete neat easy account of evil either suffered or committed and i get a, a sense that it's perhaps the thing that we understand least in one sense and we'll find out about in the coming kingdom um, i don't think i can go on for any longer otherwise i'll be here all night <laughs> right well thank you um so then uh, rebecca asks uh would you say that we are living in an age that lacks imagination uh intellect and willfulness in the search of god and if so how would saint thomas react to this mm. i think we are in an age that lacks a synthetic integrity between intellect and will and imagination i think one symbol of it is how modern people are keen on objective science and often keen on new agey um, pseudo well new agey touchy feely stuff um superstition and the idea that there's my truth and your truth and no objective truth it's a schizophrenic age where we like hard science and we don't like objective truth and those aren't compatible and i think the catholic sacramental system and the ritual liturgy that we have does offer something to feed if you like head and heart imagination and intellect and saint thomas is keen on how important sacraments are and also the poetic imagery of scripture there were lots of things 
to nourish our imagination on which our intellect depends. And what St. Thomas would say to our age, difficult to say, um, he might offer a many pronged attack where we include things like the proofs that God exists and so on, as well as the more sacramental imaginative stuff, the imagery. But I think perhaps what he would want us to do is to be open to a more vibrant view of the world. Because there are people like Richard Dawkins who think that the world is basically lots of little lumps of stuff which are here and just happen to be here and are arranged in complex ways. So Dawkins says that if there's a tiger in the room, you pretend it wants to eat you. It's really just a machine, but to calculate how it will spring, you'd be dead before you've done the calculation. So you pretend it wants to eat you. St. Thomas would say, and anyone who's lived with a cat, not with a tiger, anyone who's lived with a cat knows it does have wants. In fact, the world is not little lumps of stuff arranged mechanically. And that, that's not true to modern quantum mechanics. It's a view of the cosmos which was out of date a century ago. And there are people working now, um, doing doctorates on things like bringing Thomas into dialogue and Aristotle into dialogue with quantum mechanics. So I think we are at a point where we can say the old mechanical view of the cosmos, a false scientific view, is not the real cosmos. And we can bring some traditions into dialogue with real modern cosmology and invite people to have a more vibrant view of the cosmos. And what I mean by that is instead of seeing it as lots of little lumps of stuff merely arranged, notice how many kinds of things exist. not just stars and rocks, but also living things, plants and animals of various kinds, each with its own level of being, expressed in a level of complexity and elements of spontaneity. So I like to think of the film, The Wizard of Oz, one of the first Technicolor films, you start in a flat grey Kansas. I hope no one here is from Kansas. Start in a flat grey Kansas. Go over the rainbow into rainbow land and suddenly there's all this colour on the screen. If we see the cosmos with something like St Thomas's eyes, it becomes that bit more vibrant and we are open to seeing how special human beings are and how there might be more than human beings, there might be angels. And also open to seeing that, so to speak, the film is projected. God is projecting us into being in this vibrant cosmos, which is going somewhere. So I think there is a failure of imagination and of intellect, but I think we are at a time when perhaps we can redress this a bit more confidently, but how it gets down to the popular level is a further question. Well, thank you, Father. Um, I know you need to head off, so I think we'll uh, draw a line under the questions there, but thank you to everyone who sent them in, and thank you for coming, Father. It's been a fantastic talk. Um, don't forget, uh, we've got our AGM after Adoration Benediction Compline. Um, so come along to that. You should all have received 
uh, a Zoom link uh, by email. If you're not on our mailing list, then you can sign up at the bottom of the website. Um, and so, yeah, I look forward to seeing you all at the AGM and at the social afterwards. Uh, thank you, Father Richard, for coming. And uh, we'll now head over to the chapel for adoration, benediction, and compline. Thank you for your attention and welcome and invitation. Thank you. Is it finished?
Thank you. 
As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. My body shall rest in safety. May the God who gives us peace make you completely His, and keep your whole being, spirit, soul, and body free from all faults at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Into your hands, Lord, I commend my spirit. Into your hands, Lord, I commend my spirit. Into your hands, Lord, I commend my spirit. Protect us while we sleep, that we may be washed with Christ and dress with him in peace. You did lead your servant to go in peace according to your promise. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all nations, the light to enlighten the Gentiles, and give glory to Israel, O people. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Save us, Lord, while we are awake. Protect us while we sleep, that we may keep watch with Christ and rest with Him in peace. O Lord, God, restore us again by the repose of sleep after the fatigue of our daily work, so that continue to be by your help and may serve your body and soul. Christ God, 